People always ask how it is that I uh, manage to cover genocide, global poverty, sex trafficking, and basically be kind of upbeat and reasonably cheerful. Um, and you know, the truth is partly that side by side with the worst of humanity, you see the very best. So you see warlords doing terrible things, and you see amazing people combating them that just reaffirm your faith in the capacity of humans to do the right thing. It's an interesting problem because as a foreign journalist, oftentimes when you're writing about Chinese dissidents, other foreigners in China will say to you, you know, you give too much space, too much time, too much attention to them because most people in China don't know them. You know, why is it that you're writing about a guy like Ai Weiwei who's better known in New York than he is in Beijing? And in the end, I concluded that's the wrong way to look at it. I, I write about these figures because their experience tells us important things about Chinese politics and about Chinese sensibilities. This is the kind of dissonance over one set of events that you have every day reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Every single day. I remember so many of them. You do the best you can, okay? And sometimes you have this very unsatisfactory formulation where you have to just give both sides because you don't know exactly, right? You weren't an eyewitness, you don't, and sometimes even an eyewitness event, people are disputing what happened. I think you can say it's the end of partnership because we have to work with Russia. However difficult we have, you know, we are the two, world's two nuclear superpowers. We have to work with Russia on pressing global issues such as Iran, Syria. Um, right now, post-2014 Afghanistan, and ideally things like the future of the Arctic and climate change and those kinds of issues too. So we can't say no more partnership. Us in the United States and the West fighting this threat, we have to develop uh, solutions for local problems. We cannot just like everything is Qaeda, everything is Afghanistan, everything is Taliban. Our counterterrorism strategy shouldn't be only drones. Drones is a tactic, not a strategy. We have to develop a more comprehensive strategy in dealing with risk areas without putting American boots on the ground. And you have political conditions that make you know, individuals and companies comfortable that they can come safely to the United States. There's a lot of countries where people do business where they're not sure what it's going to look like in five or 10 years. No one asks that question about the United States. They worried about the brinksmanship and that, uh, so I think getting beyond that is good, but no one ever questioned fundamentally whether the United States was, was a safe place to do business, mm. our system of laws and, and regularity. You know, I think it's a powerful package that makes the United States an attractive place to do business. Why is it that Indian elections are so centered around leaders? Why is it that people can think that a leader can come and solve the problems of an exceedingly complex and large country? No one individual has ever solved the, all the myriad governance problems of a billion plus people. But somehow there's a belief that this can happen and Modi projected himself as a person who can actually do that. I think this is the um, reason why I'm so interested in expanding the economy. Not because I want to concentrate wealth, that's fine. I mean, we, we, we have to generate wealth but because you cannot distribute poverty. You have to distribute that wealth, and you have to do it well, and you have to do it for those in our society who are lacking the associations and the linkages with the most developed part of the economy, namely young people and women. Iran is such a complex place. It's impossible to pigeonhole. It's not this monolith, that there are all these layers that you cannot presume and you cannot judge, that you can be sitting there with a really religious man whose wife wears the chador, yet who believes the chador shouldn't be compulsory or who believes that there should be a separation between the state and religion. And there are all of these different ideas, different opinions across the social divide. When patients are starting to recover but have not yet become seronegative, so they can't be released yet because they haven't, uh, the, the Ebola virus isn't, they're still testing positive for it, but they're feeling better, they sort of naturally come to be caregivers, especially for the children. I, I think the act of solidarity is hugely compelling, and I think it will have a big difference. It'll make a huge impact on the patients. And so I think that that's one bright spot. Yeah. It's really great.